Okay, it's so quiet. I think there's still a few seconds before my time, but uh, let's, let's get started, shall we? So, um, first of all, I've, I've recalled quite a few things of what we've done so far. So, um, we started off um, doing some counting, but then uh, in, in the context of a, of a probability space, first in the context where all outcomes were equally likely, and then in the context that was more general, where um, we had this, these axioms that needed to be um, satisfied by a probability function. And so that's a context that I'll return back to briefly um, today at the beginning, because I'd like to come clean with the discrepancy um, over what I've done with splitting up the P3 axiom into two parts and what the notes do of having a more abstract uh, um, way of writing, uh, writing this axiom with only a single line and the notion of countability um, um, cropping up. Right? Um, after that, um, I, we are going back to, to um, something related to, to the notion of conditional probability, which we, um, which we introduced on Monday this week. And um, in particular, um, remember that this uh, notion allowed us to uh, work out probability of intersections um, by multiplying um, the probability uh, um, of one event with the conditional probability of the other event given the first or well, given the second, depending on, uh, on which way around you're, you're looking at the two, two events. Um, but uh, but this, um, this sort of formula is what we'll, um, we'll investigate in the context of uh, independence. Um, independence for events. Um, often, however, um, it's not so much events that we, that we try to identify and calculate probability of, um, but it is random variables that are being observed. If we throw dice, uh, roll dice, then we, um, we kind of um, um, think, well, there's the outcome of the first die, there's the outcome of the second die, and those are kind of observed in our experiment of throwing two dice. Right? And so, so that notion of a random variable is what we'll introduce in the context of what we'll refer to as discrete random variables um, at the end of today's lecture. But as I've said, I mean, let's, let's get started on, the, on just looking at these axioms, or rather the um, tricky P3 axiom um, one more time. Well, I say tricky, but maybe I should say useful, because that's, um, that's where the power of, of doing probability formally um, really gets some help rather than some inconvenience. Okay, so here's my claim. What you see up there is P3, A, and B. And what I claim is this is equivalent with a P3 um, that um, you can write as just the probability of the union over all I in I of some events. Let me call them CI now to have some different notation. Um, that um, can be written as a sum of all of those probabilities under the analogous assumptions um, requiring that the CI are events so that we can make sense of these um, um, probabilities um, and they are pairwise disjoined. And I is countable. Okay, let me put it all down. Pairwise disjoint and I Countable. Okay, remember countable means finite or countably infinite, and countably infinite means we can list the elements of the set um, as a sequence. So let's prove this. It's an equivalence, so we prove two directions. Let's do the easy direction first. We have a general statement on the right-hand side where i can be any countable index set. If we want to prove P3a, it suffices to say that if we take i to be an index set with two um, elements, like 1, 2, um, then um, we define the C1 and C2 that then appear in the statement on the right-hand side as a and b respectively. Well, then what you see in P3 here is exactly the same as what you see in P3A up there. On the other hand, if you have I being the set of natural numbers, or if he has any ambiguity about whether one, 0 is a natural number, um, let's write n in n for which n is greater than or equal to 1. And then we just said Cn 
equal to a n and they also are just the same statements in that particular choice of i. The difficult direction, well, or more difficult direction, um, is the other way because we have some special cases in some way and we want to derive a more general statement. So what, are, what is the generality we are dealing with? Well, remember, countable means finite or countably infinite. The countably infinite case is the interesting one. So let's start with that. Um, what does it mean to be countably infinite? It means we can list the elements as a sequence. So if we can write um, i in this form, which we can because it is countably infinite, with distinct xn, then let's see what we want to show is p3, what we have is p3b. So what is that sum over i in i of probability of ci that we see on the right hand side? And that's maybe the most important point to bring across here um, and probably just confirming your intuition. Um, we are summing over all p of ci here and in my notation here um, this is the sum n from 1 up to infinity of the probabilities where the c gets subscripted by xn, which is our way of listing all the little i's in capital I. And formally, um, maybe that hasn't been defined. Maybe that's just an intuitive notion for you of summing everything that, uh, that is uh, a p of c i. So let me say that is our definition of what this, um, what this countable sum actually is in this case. Because from here on, I hope you can, uh, you can complete the proof. Um, what we have is P3b. P3b says that these probabilities um, add up to the probability of the union n from 1 to infinity of those Cxn's. And the rest is set theory. Um, so this is P3b. And set theory says that union is just the union of i over i and i of ci, and we obtain what we wanted to prove. In the case where i is countably infinite, so let's just for completeness also mention the case where i n um, can be written as a finite list of elements with the same. Uh, context of being pairwise distinct here, etc., um, then um, what we do is, um, let's maybe be more explicit here, then we set a n equal to c x n for 1 less than n less than capital N. And if we want to apply um, P3b in this context, um, we also define a n to be the empty set for n greater than or equal to n plus 1, um, then uh, we have a full set of a n's um, defined to which we can apply um, P3b. And so let me just write proceed similarly. OK, that's our proof. So what you see in the notes is the same as what I've been um, handling so far in lectures using the notion of what countable means in general. That's the level at which I want to have this discussion for the purpose of this course. But those of you doing analysis um, are going to see that it is actually a little subtle to say um, the order in which we are um, adding up all these numbers is given by this particular sequence. We've made a choice, and so um, there is something more um, to explore um, once you are told that it is not always the same adding up um, sequences in one order or in another order. And uh, the reason why I don't care about this here on the one hand is that you haven't really got the tools from analysis yet, and some of you on the computer science side 
I don't know to what extent you, um, you, you actually um, need any of this or indeed see it in, in your degree. Um, but uh, more fundamentally and importantly, um, the um, way that this is being applied here, we have non-negative terms. And so if I tell you, just do it anyway, with non-negative terms, actually nothing can go wrong. And so, um, so there is um, therefore a, a couple of statements in this course where um, we do things that maybe haven't been fully formally justified at a level of analysis, um, but where um, there is no um, fundamental problem um, in, as in uh, something that is wrong that I'm writing. It's not wrong, it's just not completely justified. And uh, in the appendix to the lecture notes, you find some pointers at how we handle series in this course. And uh, that, is, um, that is, I think, where you can refer if there is anything that you're unsure about and want to know what is actually required um, for the purposes of this particular course. The advantage of doing it this way is that once those of you doing the analysis course got to the end of your first year, you can actually try and re revisit some of these, um, um, these points and see, well, actually, yes, we have seen a probability course which is mathematically rigorous with just one or two exceptions that, uh, that are easily identified but not so easily um, proved. But that's then for second year to, to fill, if you so wish. Okay, enough of that. We have, um, well, we have some more topics for today. Independence is the next one. And um, independence is kind of picking up on the ideas of, uh, of um, conditional probability in some way. So let me start this here. So, yeah, let me go straight into a definition and let me define A and B to events are independent if the probability of the intersection of those two events, A intersection B, can be written as the product of the probabilities of A and the probability of B. Okay, and uh, the reason why I've put those green arrows up there um, is to, to make you compare with what the um, definition of conditional probability provides. Um, and if you, um, if you just uh, um, look at that um, and say, well, let's just divide by probability of B here, shall we? Um, then I'd just like to caution if the probability of B is positive, we can do it. In the other case, of course, we wouldn't. Right? So, um, if, but if the probability is positive, um, then this is equivalent to the probability of A given B being equal to the probability of A. Okay? And whatever intuition tells you about this formula, it maybe takes some, uh, so some getting used to. Um, that is what I think intuitively we understand as independence, meaning uh, because it tells us that knowing B or not knowing B does not change our view of the probability of A. Okay? And so B is in some way irrelevant for A being observed. Okay, here's an example. Let's look at two fair dice. We are in the context of a um, probability space here, so let's be explicit in this instance. We have pairs of observations, all between 1 and 6. We take the f as the set of all subsets of omega, and the probability of e is equal to the number of elements of E divided by the number of elements of omega. So what does this experiment tell us? Well, we roll two dice. So if independence is going to do anything um, that we want it to do, then we should probably first check that if you have an event that only depends on the one role and an event that only depends on the other role, 
they are independent. And you can do that, right? I mean, it's just a, a matter of, uh, of counting, um, counting product sets in some way. But let's maybe look at the more subtle examples here, which are to do with um, situations where you might not expect independence. Because independence has a lot of intuitive um, um, understanding to it um, that may be misleading or that may not reveal all independences that, uh, that mathematics um, just um, gives you for reasons other than it being from the setup of the experiment, but maybe by some symmetries um, in the experiment that you, you don't immediately see if you're not, uh, not doing calculations or thinking hard why, um, why some symmetries give you uh, independence. So here are three events. A is an event only depending on the first die. So the first die shows a 4. And B is an event about the total of the two dice. So we can take the total score being 6 or event C that the total score is 7. Okay. Now, these are um, the way that we describe events in words. Um, we have a sample space. Events should be subsets of a sample space. We can translate this, right? We know which um, of the pairs correspond to the first die showing 4. They are 4, 1, 4, 2, etc., up to 4, 6. Similarly, how can we get a 6 total? We can have 1, 5, 2, for, uh, two, four, etc., up to five, one. How can we get a seven? Well, we can do one, six, etc., up to six, one. Okay, and now we can count how many um, elements there are in each of these, and um, that tells us that the probability of A is one, six. The probability of B with only five elements in that set is 5 divided by 36, size of our sample space in the denominator. Probability of C, it's 1 6, or should I write 6 36, which is equal to 1 6. How do we assess independence? Well, the definition tells us the probability of the intersection is the product of probabilities. So let's work out the probability of the intersection of A and B. This is the probability of the only common member that has a 4 in the first place and uh, adds up to 6. So that's 4, 2. There's only one of them. So 1, 36 is this probability. And you will see that this is not the same as the probability of A times the probability of B, both of which we've calculated. On the other hand, if we do the same for A and C, then um, it's very similar, right? You need a 4 in the first um, entry, you need a 7 total, so there's only one possibility. But in this instance, this is equal to the probability of A multiplied into the probability of C, because both of them are 1 6th, and if we multiply them up, we get 1 36th. And this is what I meant. I mean, did you expect these events to be independent? Some of you, you say no. Um, if you look at this hard enough, or if, you, if you're thinking, well, why am I going to do this if not to show you something? Um, well, um, then uh, this is maybe um, one of the more surprising ones. In retrospect, though, having a 4 and aiming for a 7, if you look at the problem, well, you see, it doesn't really give you any options, right? If you observe the first die in general, you can always make it to a 7 in precisely one way, no matter what the outcome of the first die is. Right? And that is maybe adding some intuition to this particular example. But it is, after all, only one particular example where it is a little bit more subtle that we get independence in the sense of the definition, um, but where it's not maybe completely clear a priori. So this is independence in the setting of two events. Let's just generalize this. Here is a generalization of this definition. Sometimes we have more than one event, and a family 
a i, i in i. Think of it as a countable family, um, but it could actually even be an uncountable family of events. We want to give meaning to the notion of independence of that family. So um, let me say where i, i is any index set. So that family is independent if, well, probabilities of intersections are products of probabilities, but the detail matters. If the probability of an intersection over i in some set j, which I'll specify, um, of a i is the product i in that set j of probabilities of a i. And we need not just one set, but we need this for all finite subsets j subset of i. OK, it's an abstract definition. Let's look at an example that just explores the meaning of this uh, for all finite subsets. So the simplest family that's more general one than what we've defined up there um, is if you have three events. So what have we defined for A, B, C to be independent? We've defined that for all finite subsets of 1, 2, 3, um, we have the um, prob probabilities of intersections equal to products. So that means, let me first write the pairwise intersections. A intersection B has to be probability of A times probability of B. Probability of A intersection C has to be probability of A times probability of C, and probability of B intersection C is probability of B times probability of C. Well, the set of all three elements is also a subset. But it doesn't have to be strict. We also require the probability of A intersection B intersection C to be equal to probability of A times probability of B times probability of C. And that's it, really. I mean, you could uh, say, well, we also need all subsets of size 1. But then the right-hand side and the left-hand side are obviously equal. And the subset of size 0, the empty set, well, you can start worrying what the empty product is. Um, but, uh, but let's not, right? I mean, this is, um, um, this is the um, interesting um, statements that you will need to check if you want to show independence, but also that you get if somebody tells you these are independent events. And there are two things that are not sufficient, right? If you um, just have um, this, um, this last, uh, last line, is, uh, it's very tempting to think, well, that involves all three events. That is what independence means, but this is not enough. There are examples, but for instance, when one of them is empty, um, where you then cannot say, well, if A and B and C are independent, then surely A and B are independent. Right? But in order to maintain such a property, you actually um, write the definition in this way. And similarly, if you only have these, this is not enough. Right? The notion of independence I've defined requires all of this to hold. Otherwise, uh, we are not saying that events are independent. We may call events pairwise independent if just the first three hold, but there's no notion that attaches itself to the last line alone um, because there's some genuine um, awkward um, consequences that we don't want to have. The first one here, um, there's an example on the problem sheet um, that uh, that you can, uh, can look at um, coming from this uh, definition of, of independence and this uh, um, discussion we've just had. 
Now let's uh, do some calculations with independence. So um, what um, can we do? Here's a theorem. Suppose A and B are independent, then I claim that A and B complement are independent. Okay, here's the proof. The statements of independence, one of them given, the other to be shown, um, both involve these intersections of A and B and of A and B complement. And it's useful to note that A is actually the union of A intersection B and A intersection B complement. And it's a disjoint union. So we can apply P3, P3A to be precise, um, and find that the probability of A intersection B complement can be written as probability of A minus the probability of A intersection B. I've subtracted that term. Okay, and that is probability of A minus probability of A times probability of B by our assumption of independence. So as A, B are independent. And now we just uh, pull things together. This probability of A as a common factor gets multiplied into 1 minus probability of B. The probability, 1 minus the probability of B is the probability of B complement. And so we conclude independence. OK, there is an extension which I'm not going to prove here, um, but which, if you want to, you can think about how to prove. It's relevant for the final problem sheet on, the, on sheet 2. Um, well, it's an induction. Well, maybe I shouldn't put uh, inverted commas. It is an induction, but one that needs to be rather carefully um, written out um, if you want to be precise. But the statement, I hope, is natural if I don't just have one event, but I have a whole sequence of events A1, A2, etc., and a whole sequence of events B1, B2, etc. Um, if they are all independent, then we can pass to complements for all the Bs, but not the As, um, as uh, um, one conclusion here. You could also take the, the As as complements, but, uh, but the interesting case is some um, complements are being taken, other complements are not being taken, and uh, the independence is maintained. Okay, so we have a definition, an abstract definition. Um, if you think about how you go about proving that, um, as I say, I'm not expecting you to, to figure out all the details, but just notice the way that this uh, definition applies is that we somehow have a countable collection of events. We need to organize them in a way um, that the i um, is a countable set that uh, enumerates all of them. So 1, 2 for choice of whether it's a or b. And then a natural number for the index would be um, the, the i. But then um, once you make statements about independence, we have to pass to any finite subset of i, right? So it is, um, it, it is here, on the one hand, that things become very abstract, but on the other hand, they become finite. And that, uh, that means that induction can attain such statements um, about all finite sizes of j. Um, you can do an induction on the number of elements of j, right? But as I say, I'm not... Uh, I'm not really um, um, trying to give you, give you the full argument here. There is, um, there is some technicality that, uh, that I don't want to insist on at this stage. Let's move on. Let's uh, do the other part 
um, that I said I was going to discuss today, discrete random variables. So events are useful and uh, the context very much is the context of a sample space um, where we have the three axioms up there and also the f axioms, I suppose, um, um, satisfied. And it's in that context that I'd like to define what a random variable is. So anything you may have learned about random variables previously will gradually um, be reconciled with this. But uh, we need to take this uh, more abstract um, approach to begin with in order to have access to some powerful tools that are not otherwise available. So as I've said, the context is a probability space, omega fp. And on that probability space, a random variable is a function x, which has as its domain this set omega um, of possible outcomes, and assigns with each outcome a real number, which is the observed quantity um, that this random variable represents. So not any function will do. We need some properties that allow us to calculate probabilities. So with the properties that first property is that the image of x, which is the set of values that x can take, so the set of all x of omega, where omega is in uh, big omega, this set has to be a, let me write, finite or countably infinite set. This is what we abbreviate as countable set. And let me also say, i.e., mx can be written as the set x1, x2, etc. Okay, and we will generalize this eventually, but for the time being, we don't have the tools to do anything more general than random variables taking countably many values. And then b, um, once we have this, it's useful to look at what the probabilities are that these possible outcomes are the actual outcomes of our experiment. So for each x in R, whether or not it is in the image, um, the omega in omega such that x of omega is equal to this x, this has to be a member of our um, collection of events f. So meaning this is an event to which a probability has been assigned. Right? The probability space is given. Um, here we are just saying a random variable must be such that this subset of the sample space is an event. And then we do what we um, naturally do with events. We record the probability and um, what it means to have an outcome that gives us x is that we observe that the random variable x takes the value little x. And we will abbreviate this event to just say that. So we will abbreviate this event to curly bracket because of this um, underlying meaning, but then capital X equal to little x as the most concise way of retaining the idea of a subset of a sample space and the fact that uh, that capital X is equal to the little x. Okay, so that's our notation to represent this and write
probability of x being equal to x. Here I haven't put curly brackets, but the meaning is that this is the probability of the event x equal to little x, which in longhand, of course, is still the probability of the set of all omega in omega for which x of omega, x of omega is little x. Okay, and those are, of course, the interesting events because if you are asking what's the probability that the first die came out as a three, um, then, uh, then this is um, now, if x corresponds to the first die, then um, this is the event x equal to three that you're after. Regardless how many more dice you've been rolling or how many other experiments you've been doing at the same time and incorporated in the same sample space. Okay, here's an example. Let's do this example with two dice. And let's maybe be explicit about the sample space, although often um, we may not be. Um, but for now, we have to be in order to, um, to give you the uh, context of how this all is meaningful. So the sample space from, from previously, um, now examples of random variables. would be, um, well, let me write a few, a few different ones here. They are the obvious ones, uh, but uh, x of ij equal to maximum of ij is, is a random variable just the same as um, y of ij equal to i plus j, one that we've in some way used in our, um, um, in our event b and also in c. Um, from of the previous example, um, then we have z of ij equal to i, which is in some way the random variable that we used in, uh, in the first of the events, in the event a. And finally, um, let me also say random variables don't have to be um, functions that can be written in closed form as some nice expression that fits into one line. Um, it can also be a distinction of cases. Um, function means to every member of omega we assign a value in the real, uh, among the real numbers. We might just uh, um, assign uh, 1 and 0 um, depending on whether i is greater than j or i is less than or equal to j. Right. And this is in fact uh, a special case of uh, what we will refer to as an indicator function of an event, but I'll refer to, uh, I'll get back to, to that another time. So for now we have this simple sample space um, that gives us an examples of discrete random variables and makes one point that is maybe not immediately obvious from the definition. If you have one sample space, you can define lots and lots of different random variables on the same sample space, and they are all related. You can immediately make sense of joint probabilities of one variable doing one thing, another variable doing another thing, um, and, uh, and there is, uh, there's therefore a lot of flexibility of making use of this. Whereas if you've previously seen random variables, maybe that wasn't so obvious that you could relate them or indeed how precisely they are related. Here, of course, there's work to do in order to achieve what you want to achieve from your random variables. But uh, once you have a sample space with random variables, um, you can do all the calculations in principle. So let's start maybe reconciling um, with what you may have seen as random variables before. So definition, I want to define a probability mass function. And this is the object, I mean, this is a name, but uh, 
I'm not sure if that name is being used at school, but um, even if it isn't, it's the kinds of probabilities that you associate with random variables, like these binomial probabilities or Poisson probabilities um, that, uh, um, that would be um, showing up as what we call a probability mass function here. It is, in the context where we have a random variable, is the function p sub x, which takes the um, real line into 0, 1, and assigns the probability px of little x, which is the probability that the random variable x takes the value little x. OK, and we define this for all members of R. I've also said, oh, let's look at this event for all x in R. But this image of x is kind of relevant because if little x is not in the image of x, that means that this set here that I've defined is the empty set. Because if little x is not in the image of x and there is no omega, um, that satisfies the constraint x of omega equal to little x. And so the empty set is a member of f. Um, and we know what probability we've assigned to it, not by the axioms, but by a consequence of the axioms, we get probability 0 um, assigned to that event. So we can note that um, if x is not in the image of x, not in the image of x, then what we've defined is that px of little x is equal to what I've identified as being the probability of the empty set, which is 0. And also, the non-zero terms, let's just sum over all the values that are in the image of x, so the remaining values, so to speak. If we sum up all the values that we've assigned here, that means that we are summing over all x in the image of x, the probability of the set of all omega in capital omega for which x of omega is little x. Okay, what are these events as x varies? Well, x is a function. It takes one precise value of x. So if we take two different values, then um, these are um, e events that are pairwise disjoint. Okay, so we apply P3, and we find that this is the probability of the union over all possible values of the random variable of the event omega in omega for which x of omega is equal to little x. But what is this? Every omega is assigned to some value x in the image of x. So if you take union over all values in the image of x, then that is um, just your whole sample space. Okay, so we get that this is equal to the probability of omega, which is 1. Right? So what have we done? Well, we've said that if we sum up the probabilities for x to take value little x over all possibilities for x, then we get probability 1, which, which is saying that one of the values, little x, in the image of x is being taken by our random variable. So we can kind of look at this calculation um, with some constraints and say, um, if S is not all of R but a subset of R, subset of image of X, if you like, um, then we can work out, or maybe define at this stage, what the probability um, is that X takes, a value, takes values in that set capital S. So this we define to mean the probability of the set of all omega in omega for which x of omega is in capital S. And in the same way as we've uh, passed from a probability of a 
union of events to a probability, um, a sum of probabilities, we can write this um, as a sum over all x in S. Well, only the members of the image of x are relevant, and uh, that is in fact a countable set. So that um, this sum over the probabilities of x equal to little x is meaningful. And this, maybe we should use our notation and say we have defined our probability function. This is p sub x of little x. Okay, so we have a, a model in which we can make sense of probabilities of random variables to take individual values. We call the function that emerges the probability mass function. And by summing up the probability mass function over um, little x in some set, subsets s of the real line, we obtain probabilities um, of the random variable falling into that subset of the real line. Well, it's all pretty abstract up to this point, so let's finish by looking at at least one example. So here are some of the classical probability distributions. And there'll be more on Monday. So the simplest probability distribution is the Bernoulli distribution. So here, the image of x is the set 0 and 1. So two outcomes which you can use for coin flips, but also in many other contexts. So there's a parameter, p in 0, 1, the probability of observing a 1, in fact. And then we say x has Bernoulli distribution. And I'm introducing terminology more generally here um, then just for this Bernoulli distribution, we say random variables have distribution, have distributions um, with certain parameters, in this case, parameter p. So what does this mean to have a probability distribution with parameter p, a Bernoulli <laughs> distribution with parameter p means the probability that the random variable x takes value 1 is that parameter p, and, and the probability that x is equal to 0 is 1 minus p. I've said that's my image of x, so the probability for x to take any other value, little x, is implicitly equal to 0 here. OK, where does the Bernoulli distribution arise? I've kind of mentioned. Um, coin flips if you assign one to heads and uh, zero to tails. Um, but more generally, um, if we have a probability space, then any event gives rise to um, a Bernoulli random variable. So if A is an event with probability P of A equal to little p, then um, if we define x of omega to be the indicator function, maybe I'll write a different indicator function, um, a 1 with a double bar um, of the event. No. Yeah, well, this is somewhat ad hoc notation. So omega um, being in A is what I want to define here. Um, that is, no, let, let, me, let me do this differently. Let me write indicator sub A, and it's a function of omega that I'm defining here. It's a random variable, um, and I want to assign value 1 or 0, depending 
on whether omega is in A or omega is not in A, respectively. Okay, so this symbol here um, is what I'll refer to as indicator function. Okay, what uh, the context I've been doing this in is that with this definition, x will have Bernoulli p distribution. And I realize I wanted to introduce lots of notation, but I didn't introduce all notation. So let me insert into here that we write x twiggles ber of p, right? Or let me, I mean, this is exactly what I've written here, but it's a terminology notation um, that I want to use in general. The twiggles means has distribution, and the ber of p is my abbreviation for the Bernoulli distribution. Okay, so here is therefore um, the first example, and uh, just, I mean, I claim this is a Bernoulli distributed random variable. Um, let's just check that the probability that x is equal to 1, well, x is equal to 1 if and only if omega is in A. So this is the probability, if you like, of the set of all omega in omega for which x of omega is equal to 1. Uh, or indeed for which omega is in A, well, that's just the probability of A, and that we started off with as being P. Right? So this is essentially the check um, that, um, that we have a Bernoulli distribution here. The only other relevant observation is that 0 and 1 are the only possible values, and so the probability that x is equal to 0 has to be 1 minus p, because if we sum over all possible values, we always get 1 in the context of any random variable. And this is all for today. Thank you.